we've got to be able to wrap up the hazard topic today and, and call this an end to hazard section and move on to operability. Um, I just wanted to let everyone know that the meeting so far has been going well. Uh, Dr. Marlon was in the, the meetings yesterday with the groups that met. Uh, a lot of productive discussion, some really, really insightful um, comments and advances were made by some of the groups, and so I'm really pleased to see that. Just a bit of feedback for the rest of you coming into the rest of you. As I mentioned on Friday, please make sure that your groups are comfortable with the, with the units on your flow sheet, that you understand what they're doing, so that the discussion in the meeting can be productive, right? So we don't want to spend our meeting figuring out what's going on in our flow sheet. That's something that you've had several weeks now to do and, and work through on Aspen. So make sure you look up what some units are if you don't know how they work. So if you're coming to the meeting, we can talk about the control systems and alarms and so forth. So we need to be a little bit more productive than, than one other one would be. So let's, let's come back to hazard and operability as a quick refresher here. So we said when we looked at this topic that we'll assemble a group of people with a variety of skills together and we'll focus on various nodes in the flow sheet and our procedure we follow is to select a node, for each node we'll select multiple parameters, and for each parameter we'll select multiple guidelines. So it's a very combinatorial process. And then once we finish with this node, we'll move on to the next downstream section. And as we said in the class, it can take several hours to do even just a small part of the flow sheet. So we, we had the uh, we had looked at some of that last time, and as an example, we said let's consider this node here after the pump um, and splitter. So it's a very specific piece of pipe that we're considering, and we're considering a parameter in this example of flow. And we were looking at various guidelines. In particular, we could look at less, and less in this case would mean less than normal flow. So we're always <coughs> relative to some baseline or some deviation. And then once we've established that, so we've got our node, we have our parameter, we've got our guide word, then we go look at, well, what can cause this situation? What can cause this deviation? What would be the consequence of that deviation? And then what action will we take? Now, it's quite clear that if the consequences are fairly minor, the action you take will be proportionate to that. So you're not going to implement a safety interlock system, for example, for a situation that has only very minor consequences. So the cost and the amount of work you go do here in the action is very much proportional to the consequence that, um, that can happen, as well as the probability. So if the probability of this deviation occurring is very low and the consequence is low, your action might be to do nothing. Simply just accept that. So the consequence by divine it might only mean like a spill of water on the floor. Okay? And the probability of that happening is low, the consequence is low, there's really no action to take. But if the probability is low and the consequences can be pretty dramatic, then you will take action. So, for example, the probability very low is an aircraft falling on the facility. Okay? Very, very low probability. But the consequence of that may be low and or high. So if you're a nuclear facility or you're dealing with explosive material, the consequence can be dramatic, so you may take appropriate action. And that's exactly what the nuclear industry does. But in other industries, the consequence of that, and the, given the probability of it being so low, it's not worth implementing all that cost to, to go forth with that action. So what companies will do is they'll set up ratings. They'll give a rating of 1 to 5 for the consequence. They'll give a rating of 1 to 5 for the probability. And then the, the product of that now is numbered between 1 and 25. And then they'll have various levels of severity. <coughs> so every that's why we won't go into this. Every one of you that have done a co-op term and have done this will have seen a different way of doing it. Every company has their own particular method. Some companies will use low, medium, high. Others will use a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 scale. Um, there's so many variations on this. And sometimes they won't even call these hazards. Other companies will call them all sorts of names. Right? So, but the principle is this. Is this. Once you've established your node, your parameter, your guide word, you go through this and use, uh, use the knowledge of the people around the table to figure out what can cause a deviation, what the consequences are, and what is a suitable action. So the only way you can really do this is with practice. So let's take a look at this. 
Uh, now, obviously, the answer is here in your notes, so that's, that's okay. But I'd like you to consider this case anyway and think through it without reading ahead in the notes. It's no good just reading the answer. But think through the case of this situation. Let's take a look. We have a fire heater, so this is this box over here, where we're burning fuel coming in at the correct ratio with air. So we're creating heat. And we're using it to heat a certain feed. So here's my feed valve coming in. I'm splitting it out. Um, I, can, I have two other valves, so we can control ratio over here. Notice I send those in through the flue stack first, so I'm using that to recover some of the heat in my flue stack as well. And I'm sending it through the main part of the flame. This will heat it up and we, we send that off to, to be processed in some sort of reactor or whatever the next step is. Okay, so where would we use these sorts of fire heaters in a process? Why don't I use steam? We, I think we covered this last time. We said that steam, if you use hot water or steam to, to heat this, you cannot always get the temperatures you need out here for the product. So we'll often introduce a fire heater to heat this. So this is no different. In fact, this is exactly the same, pretty much, to the hot water heater that you have in your basement, in your, in your next year furnace. Right? So every house, we have a hot water heater. Similar idea okay, going on in, in that hot water heater. By and large. So we've got these in our homes. You can be sure that the company that made those have gone through similar situations and, and tried out these sorts of hazards. So let's take a look at one particular issue here. Yeah, we're going to look at just this node. After this valve, before we split, what is the consequence of flow being at this level? We're going to consider that our guide, our node to be that feed pipe, our parameter is flow, and our guide word is no flow. Okay, so take a look, list what are the causes of no flow in that piece of pipe, what are the consequences, and what action will you take. Now, causes, you can, I don't mind if you read the answers here. Okay, consequences, I want you to think through, and actions, I want you to be so specific that you go draw the diagram of the actions that you would take. How would you rebuild this process or add to the process to make those consequences minor? So even though you have the solution that you don't, what you don't have in front of you is a detailed action plan and draw on that drawing, create a PNID of what your output is going to be. This is what, we, what we're looking for in the course project, so it's a good practice. Right? Okay, so you, you'll need at least four or five minutes to work through that and think through what that PNID should look like after this. So let's discuss that in a few minutes.
the action. slide you'll see all those consequences over there and actions. <laughs> so add to the pin ID what the actions would be would look like for those things as well. chance to get to those PNIDs, particularly for the, some of the later actions. PNID drawing is something that you need a lot of practice on, right? So you can look at all the PNID drawings in the world and think you understand exactly what's going on, and you probably will, but it take, it's a lot harder to draw it yourself, right? So given it's a required specification that's verbally written, so something that's written here in these action items, Remember, you as the engineer will be responsible for these actions. You have to then go take those actions and draw the drawing to give to someone in instrumentation, electrical engineering, or an outside contractor. The vendor, you have to give them a full, fully specified PMID drawing and say, here, build this for me, give me a quote, and then come and install it. Right? So you're going to be responsible for translating those texts over to PMID. So it's something that uh, just looking at existing PNIDs you, you, is fine, but actually drawing them yourself is a good skill to, to practice. So let's take a look and work through this hazard. This is an important point. So no feed flow caused by a variety of reasons. Uh, one of the, the first one written here is that that feed pump stops. So this pump over here feeding to, to the furnace stops. So it quits on you. And 
the consequence of then that no flow in all these in these situations could result as far as you're damaging this, this piping inside the first. So your fuel over here is still going, your air is still going over here, there's nothing flowing in these pipes, nothing to take up that heat. So those pipes start to melt and you cause loss of integrity in those pipes. Okay. Now that could be that's expensive capital costs. Right? But it can go a little bit further than that. We haven't really specified what we're feeding inside of it. If this was water or some sort of non-flammable fluid, that would be fine. You're still just, you ruined the whole of the equipment. But if this is flammable um, fuel oil, then any residual material in that pipe uh, can also lead to, lead to some bad consequences as well. Okay, so consequences here are lot, uh, significant damage to capital costs. So this is a serious consequence. We need to take some serious action to prevent this from occurring. Just uh, before we get going, some other ways that the pump uh, might fail and cause no feed flow is that the wiring to the pump gets damaged by some operator. Okay, so that's, we've considered, we <coughs> assume we've already considered that here. So it's include existing safeguards. What that we mean is we don't need to go add to this table if some things have already been taken care of. Right? So if the, if the wiring to this, to this pump is already in, made as safe as it could possibly be made, um, then we don't go add that to the hazard table. Right? So we don't go add redundancies in here. In other words, by this include, we mean we've taken into account existing safeguards already. So feed pump is stopped. The suggestion here is if that feed pump stops, let's add a backup pump. Okay, so we've got, let's call this P1A over here. Let's add a backup pump now, P1B. So we've got a backup pump over here. Where do we where do we take it? Where do we put it? First side. Do we introduce it over here? Here? Somewhere here? Where do we what do we feed it from? As well. People feed it from some or string, yes. Okay, so same. Same feed over here. Do we put a valve in here? Yes. No. What if that valve is closed? Do we really need that backup pump? Right, so the moment we go put a valve in here and we turn that pump comes through, remember this pump is going to come on automatic, automatic startup of backup pump. So if this valve is closed, we're just going to ruin the pump and actually not achieve anything. Okay, so maybe this is where PNIDs and these decisions are tough, right? Because we want to also have a valve here so we can isolate the pump later on for maintenance. But we also don't want a valve here so that we have three mile island reoccurring when valves were shut that weren't supposed to be shut. Okay, so probably no valve. Given that this is a, a backup pump, it's only it's not intended to be used under normal situations. So no valve for that reason, so that it's it is going to be available to us. Okay, so no flow to the pump. It, uh, so the question is this forcing because okay, there will be flow in that pipe to the pump. Okay, so what this this pump is on, mm -hmm. and it's going to take that liquid, the pump of least resistance is going right. to pull through there. Right. Okay, so there may be some minor minor flow. Right. Could we put a one-way valve to prevent backflow, in, so that this doesn't get sucked in over here? Okay, so you see how this gets gets messy, right? There's no there's there's many alternatives we have to consider. So yeah, we could have a valve. But then we want to instrument that valve so that it's always open, okay, and that it will alarm if it's shut. Okay, so there, there, there's this valve here, and we'll put an asterisk here because I don't have a good symbol for that, and I'm, we're not going to—I don't want to clutter this diagram with too many lines just yet. So that asterisk is a note that this valve needs to have some some alarm on it or some monitoring to make sure it's always open, because this is a critical critical instrument. 
uh, this pump here we want to have the end. So now we're pumping along here, and we need to introduce the sum. Okay, so we'll we'll get to that point. I'll come back to this in a minute. So let's just hold that that one over there. We'll come back to the automatic vacuum pump. Let's clutter up the diagram first with some of these other with other with other options. So if the feed valve is uh, another way that we can get no flow is if this feed valve here is closed. So if we're referring to this valve over here. Okay, so that how would that valve close? So if, if this circuitry is broken in some way to cause that valve to fail, we want this valve to always fail open. Okay, so this should be a fail open valve. So wherever we have valves on our door drawings, always indicate FO or FC as well. So, so we enhance our drawing here by specifying or requiring our supplier to give us a fail open valve at that point. Another way that this system can give low uh, no flow is if if we read a reading that says that's false and this control system goes and shuts that valve. So feed flow read indicates a false high flow. This is trying to control it to a certain level and so it goes and closes the spell for us because this reading here is too high. Okay, so FC is reading too high goes and shuts the valve. Let's add a, a backup valve. What does that look like? Oh, sorry, add a backup flow here, a redundant flow. Where do we add that redundant flow here? So here's my, here's my current flow meter over here. Where do I add the redundant flow? Do they go straight past the valve? Not past the valve. Right. Before the valve, after the valve, Okay, clearly we, we want that flow meter to be before the valve. Okay, if this valve is, currently this system is like this, right? So if this valve is shut, having a flow meter over here is, we want a redundant flow meter. Okay, so it's going to, in, this flow meter, if this one is correct, it's going to be no flow correctly for us. So just Okay, so let's okay, so we can look at this this option. Either we add the flow here or here. Let's take a look at it here and then we can look at it there. It's a good can be a good discussion. So add our redundant flow flow over here. So we've got F, let's call this F1 and this is F2. So redundant flow meters are added. So that we take this reading into an FY. Take that reading F1 to FY, and are we going to take the, lock, the highest or the lowest of the two? No, we're saying one meter is going to fail or would give us a false high reading. Would an average be? Take, take the lower of the two. Okay, so we want to be conservative here. FY comes, comes in. Take that into my flow controller. Okay, so we're always going to take the lower of the two readings. So remember, we want feed through this pipe. We want feed coming along here into my furnace. I'd rather send too much in the case of an error on one of these sensors. So the last thing I want to do is send no feed. We've already established that sending no feed is really catastrophic. So, um, if you do three flow meters and have like a voting system, is that, or is that just too expensive? So, three flow meters and have a voting system, you can evaluate that cost and trade it off relative to the damage on the furnace. So, it's, it's likely that adding a third flow meter is going to be quite okay. So, we can just add it in over here. So let's come back to the uh, suggestion of adding it after the valve. So if I add an F2 here instead, okay, so let's just keep this diagram for now, but also let's consider this alternative case where instead of F2 before the valve, let's put it after the valve. 
F2 goes into Fy and it takes the lowest of these two flows. Will it make a difference? Well, why is it different where you put it after? Because if it detects that there's no flow or flow, then it controls itself. Like instead of doing like the product, like checking between the two, if it just detects that the flow is too low, it just automatically tells it out to increase it to what it should be. Okay, I, I understand that. That's, that's good logic. Let's take a look at how the system behaves under normal operation. So in the normal operation, it's going to take these two signals and send the lower of the two to FC. So it's going to read this and everything is operating fine. This, the lower of the two signals, these two should agree pretty much the same. Okay, so within minor error. My only concern is that they will probably be fighting a little bit here because these, these never really agree with each other. But um, that should be okay because we're similar to up, up here, right? Let's take a look at the failure condition. So if F1 fails and reads too high, then F2 is your only reliable reading. Take the lowest of the, so it's going to take F2 and control the valve. Okay, so then essentially you've created a feedback control loop through F2 here. Well, if F2 fails and reads too high, then F1's reading is going to be used. Then we're back to just our original system that we had. So the only concern that I have is that we, we almost never instrument this way with the flow after the valve, okay? so, which is what will happen under that failure mode. That's the only reason. I, it, I think it will work. There, must, there might be another reason why this is not suitable, but from what I can see, F2 after the valve micro. It's just that we just don't do it like that. <laughs> so we always measure flow and then control the valve afterwards. That's, that's the only reason that could work. So, that's the, that's the system there when we say add in a redundant flow meter, we need to do this extra. Work. So that's, we've, we've added that to our function. Okay, so number four, is there's a blockage in the pipe. Um, so here the assumption is if we read the, concept, the actions here, we test the flow before startup, so make sure that we actually have a flow. If there is no flow, then you obviously don't continue on with startup. Um, also, place a filter in line in the pipe. We've seen that in the PNID assignment last week to have filters in our pipes to prevent blockage. Okay, let's take a look at number five there. If the pipe fails, so we're referring to this, our node, right? This is our node over here. If this pipe fails in some way, someone drives a forklift truck into it or damages that pipe, so catastrophic failure of this pipe or a major crack in this pipe of some sort. So now, no control system is going to do anything for you, right? So no. No feedback over here, no redundant valves. None of these are going to save you. You've just physically cut off this, this node over here. We need to remotely activate block valves at the feed tanks to allow the operators to stop the flow. Okay, so this pipe is broken. You're spewing oil or some material out here. We need a way to cut a little bit here. Okay, so block valves up here need to be added. Remotely activated block valves at the feed tank. So presumably there's, there's a tank further upstream here that's feeding this. Block valves on that tank outlet to allow the operators to stop the flow. Okay. There's something else there that we require. Because we've stopped this flow coming into the pump. So no flow, no flow, feed to the furnace, there's no flow, but that flame is still going in the furnace. We're still feeding fuel and we're still feeding oil uh, and air over here. Okay, so we need something else. It's not good enough just to turn off the feed, we also need to turn off the, the fuel source. And that's where our SIS system will kick in. So SIS, that's the second row here. So we're still related to this this cause, still related to this consequence, which the actions we're going to take are two actions. This is our first action. Our second action is to create an SIS system. So the SIS system needs to, as said, stop fuel flow, 
when we have low or no fee flow using a separate fee flow sensor. Okay, so now we're adding a new fee flow sensor. F3. And this is going to SIS, it's called SIS1. So SIS-1 is a piece of computer logic that takes in flow value 3 and takes some action. What actions, yes? Could you also say that if that build open valve was ever shut, then uh, you could create an interlocking switch either off? Okay, so if this valve was ever fully shut, send that to interlock. Yeah. Um, I, don't see a reason why that could also be an input into the SIS. Okay, so if you take this valve position and add it as a second input into SIS. So SIS remembers in computer logic. So it's, you write a little piece of software routine that takes any amount of inputs and does any sort of output. So you can absolutely take in this valve position as well as this flow, as well as any other inputs on the process that you'd like. So you could say if valve position is fully shut or this flow is zero, then do such and such. Okay, but hold that thought for a minute because we haven't completed this diagram yet. So let's not use this valve position just yet. Let's just only focus on flow three. So our logic is going to be SIS1. We're going to write a computer solution that says if F3 is approximately zero. So we're going to put in some tolerance or some very small value because remember these flows always are recorded with error. So if F3 is approximately zero, then what actions are we going to take? Close fuel valve. So if you had, if we were in this class trying to do the full PNID for the system, we would then go and add on a fuel valve. Well, there's, I guess you need to. Uh, yeah. So we add, like we did a few classes ago, we had that freeway solenoid valve. We'd go add one of those onto our drawing. So close fuel valve. Great. Anything else? Uh, what would you do? Probably also want to relieve pressure if there is any existing pipes in the furnace. So relieve pressure in the pipes. How would we do that? Um, could be a downstream valve that could be fully open or a vent somewhere. Okay, so open a downstream valve on the product. <coughs> that valve we're allowing the material to move out. Okay. Anything else? So, so that would it be better if it's placed under the furnace? Anything else? Sorry, if what is out of F3 had like on the project screen, like after it was like exiting the furnace. So if we don't see any flow leaving the furnace. Yeah, so maybe there's a leakage before that point, so it's going to take that with the furnace. Okay, so where's the leakage? It's like, like after it's exiting the, the top of the building. Okay, from that. good point. Okay, so, so Mo has identified, should we be measuring the flow here on the product stream leaving? Okay, maybe both. Maybe both? Okay, absolutely. So you can see that where it's going. That's going to be our one of our next nodes. One of our next nodes is we're going to consider the piping inside the furnace, and we're going to do low flow, no flow, high flow, and that's exactly where you'll identify what you just mentioned over there. So we will we would get to it if we were doing a full hazard on the system. Okay, but it just would come later on. A good point. There was another comment. No. Yeah. Is it assuming both pumps are down? So no, we're, we're considering the case uh, catastrophic failure okay. on this node over here. So we've already shut down this valve. 
So we've got nothing coming in. We just don't want to ruin our, what we're simply focusing on now is we don't want to ruin our equipment. Okay, so we've got all that piping in the furnace, the flame is still going, we just don't want to damage our equipment. You have to do that on some sort of thing to the SIS, like, I mean, a amount of time, because if you have to have time for your lack of pump to get started and restore flow, if your pump failure, because you don't want to shut down. Okay, so we don't want false shutdown, so we need some sort of time delay when, if we're reading no flow over here, You've got to have a few seconds so we can actually start up the process. When you start up the process, F3 is legitimately zero. Okay, but we don't want to think, oh, shut the, f the fuel valve down and, and do all these other actions. So there needs to be some delay, some delay for startup. Okay. Anything else we need around SIS1? So we've shut down our fuel. Uh, is it just regarding pump B? How does pump B know when to start? Is it just in the program? We're going to come back to that, yeah. So I said we're just going to temporarily come. I just don't want to clutter up this drawing. I'll, we'll bring in that complexity in a minute. Yeah. Pump B is purely for backup, right? We we're dealing with a case where this valve is shut. So pump A, L, B doesn't, doesn't concern us right now. Any other actions you take with SIS? in the logic. What else is happening around this furnace? Any, no, I, I'm referring to any other actions we would take. So a few other things. Right, so right now our operators are sitting over there on the other side of the property, two kilometers away. This all has happened automatically. They have no knowledge of this yet, right? So none of this, this all takes place automatically. We need to tell the operators about it. So send them along. something we don't want to have happen to us. 
This is not something that happens on a daily basis, not even a monthly basis. SIS is for extreme situations. So going to these sort of extreme levels where you're shutting the furnace fully, opening a damper 100%, blowing it out with air, just clearing out the situation to make it as safe as possible for the equipment and for the people around you. So there's, we've spent a good almost 45 minutes just on one node, on one parameter. We, let's go back to the backup pump. So we've got this backup pump over here. Where should we introduce that, that pump's feed? Given what we've just said and discussed. Should I introduce it over here? Over here? Over there? You would need to insert it before the valve so that your control still functions. Okay, so these controls are for which valve? That middle one. Okay, so if I introduce it over here, then are these controls going to be affected? Yeah, because there's a flow going through that valve. Okay, so the suggestion is to introduce the flow up there. Okay, any other places? I think maybe before F3. Before F3? <laughs> after F3? Okay, so clearly not after F3. So we're down to two situations, either before F3 or here before the flow control system. So what's the purpose of this flow control system? <coughs> Okay, flow in this heater. What's the purpose of pump 1B? If pump 1A fails. So it's pump 1B is only used in failure of 1A. Okay. So under regular operation, pump 1A is working, these, these, these are working just fine. Okay. Only under failure is pump 1B working. So under, when you're in failure mode, it's something that's temporary and short term. I would argue that you should introduce your flow over there rather than here, because what's going to happen if you put it in over here, then this is going to become your normal mode of operation. People are just going to use this flow control system. Now, that could also be good from a flexibility point. So we're going to talk about flexibility next week. Well, what if you use like a lead ladder so you're not always running pump one or pump one A, if you want one rotate. Okay, so yeah, that part of flexibility we're going to talk about next week. So you can argue from a flexibility point of view you want it over here, from, from a pure safety point of view where pump 1B is only for, for backup use, that you introduce it here. There's a few other things related to that. Right? So pump 1B, as is, would you implement the system as is? So let's take, let's take this option for now. It doesn't, what I'm going to show you next would work for either option, so it doesn't matter. But let's just remove the line over there. Is that good enough as shown over there? What's missing? What's going, what could go wrong? The pump that you could turn on and then not actually be working, so you need to have a flow meter on that. Or would you get to do that three, I guess? Three function. Yeah, so Pump 1B, this, this loop over here is only for emergency. It's not typical operation. Yeah. So yeah, we still get that flow. Yeah. So definitely want to introduce it here so we get F3 running so we don't, need, don't use SRS. <laughs> then we've got a, a, a day or two to fix up that pump, fix up that wiring, while pump 1B helps us out. But what's anything? You don't have any basic process control there, just go straight to the Okay, so no process controls here, but again, this is just for backup, so this shouldn't be normal operation. Right? So we don't, we don't need those, those flows and those controls. But if pump 1A, one of, one of the things we do need is we want to isolate this loop from this loop. Okay, so we want some one-way one -way valves over here. Okay, so just a one-way check valve. Okay, to prevent any backflow and wrong, wrong, wrong direction flow. So 
a little bit more, but yeah, could you use that same check valve on your valve as a star? Okay, so back here, suggestion to use a one-way valve over here. Okay, so recall that this valve was introduced so that we don't have flow into the pump. So this is a one-way valve this direction, so it allows one-way flow this way. We put that valve there to not have that direction. Okay? So back to regular valve. Okay, complete yet? Not complete? Okay, the only other thing we don't have yet is we haven't said how pump 1B is going to turn on. Pump 1B needs to turn on when we said the automatic backup on low feed pressure. So we need some instrumentation for that. So we'll need to measure the pressure over here. So we want, the idea is that this pump turns on when there's low pressure in this section. So I need to record that pressure or the aura flow, either one would work, and then bring this down and pull the motor for that pump. Have that hooked into the motor. So when this pressure reads low or zero or this flow, you can use either P or F. So low, low pressure or low flow, then that motor kicks in. Okay, so in that case, this becomes a PC or an FC. It's a controller of some sort. Because it's taking action to that motor. It's going to start that motor when it reads low pressure. It's a very simple control. control. OK, so P and ID diagram has changed a lot from what you see over there on the right where we started off with what we what we ended up with on the left. Okay, so I'm hoping that this last 45 minutes, we never really even got to the other slides I hope to get to, but this is the sort of thinking and detail you need to go through in your hands off and app operability section of the project. And document that thinking in your in your project. Any any questions on this? Yeah, um, are we in, for this product are we using every node in our no, okay, so in your project you're doing this only on one node with two parameters. Okay, so clearly your level of detail is going to be excessively large on one section of your PID diagram if you happen to do it as a box. But we definitely don't expect you to go to this, like this is all safety related in controls. Your regular controls for regular operation needs to be on your entire yeah. section of your process. But the safety controls, that needs to be only on the alarms too. Sorry, just alarms on one side. Okay, yeah, so we, we hadn't spoken about alarms, but you would certainly have a discussion in your report on alarms. So let's just quickly end off there by just talking about the alarms then on F3, if you're monitoring F3, F3 should be here under regular operation. Here you have some alarm limits, and then down here you would have the SIS. So F3, as long as it's operating around here, that's regular operation. If it dips down below this level, that's when you send an alarm to the operator so they're aware of an impending problem with low or no flow. to the And then SIS is some sort of offset away from the SIS kicks in when this flow is really so low that this flow would not be able to sustain the heat added to the pipe. Okay, so we'll pick this up a little bit next class and then we'll introduce the next class. <laughs>